Hello. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk to you today. I uh, appreciate being invited, uh, and thank you to the organizers. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my research in big data and education, and particularly I'm looking to how we can harness big data sets to improve educational technologies. So first I want to ask you guys a question. Which of these pictures represents the classroom of the future? How many of you think it's the one on the left? How many of you think it's the one on the right? Not many. Uh, how many think it's neither? <laughs> how many think it's both? <laughs> I would argue the answer is both. Um, we, we will maintain being stuck in more of a classroom situation for a lot longer due to a lot of reasons. And I think what your classroom is going to look like is very much dependent on how much money you have. But it might not be what you guys are thinking. And I somewhat took those two pictures to make a kind of the argument of opposite of what I think it's actually going to be. So it is going to be rich versus poor. But it's going to be the poor kids that are going to be forced to rely on cheap technology, while the rich kids are going to be the ones that have access to the really expensive teachers. And I know Siddhartha uh, yesterday talked about the salary disparity here, but even even today, even in Brazil, where the teachers are making 300 US dollars a month, technology has gotten so cheap that you can go now, I was in China a few months ago, and tablets are 25 US dollars a piece. So you could almost get 10 tablets for one month of a teacher's salary here in Brazil. So more and more, I think we're going to see the poor uh, kids in society forced to use this technology. And we're really seeing this today. I don't know if anyone in this audience know of the Waldorf School. Has anyone heard of the Waldorf School? OK, there's a few out there. So the Waldorf School is a Silicon Valley school that has no technology. The people of Facebook and Google, they're sending their kids to this school, which has no ed tech. You guys know the Next Generation Learning Challenge grants, Wave 3? So this was a uh, Gates-funded Educause uh, funding situation where they were funding um, people to create online degrees for higher ed for less than $5,000 for the entire deg degree. So again, this is uh, the MOOC stuff was really coming out of this. We're seeing that as well. You know, everyone knows these MOOCs really cheap, pushing prices down. Online courses, uh, we see, you know, we see this proliferation of uh, state schools and higher ed schools getting into these online courses because they're, they're huge money makers for the universities. They, they can scale these things really high. Um, so, but is the technology as good? That, that's a good question. Um, we're seeing a lot of adaptive uh, companies. Uh, how many of you heard of Newton and uh, Smart Sparrow? And again, Carnegie Learning, which came out of uh, Carnegie Mellon. These are all adaptive learning companies that are really relying on technology to make learning better. And more. Uh, how many of you heard of the new uh, Education X Prize by the Ansari? They're going to offer uh, five $1 million prizes and one $10 million prize to build a tablet that will teach um, math and reading to uh, kids in Africa. So what's this mean? I, I, in my view, I think we have to accept it. It's an economic reality that's coming. There's really no way that we can uh, force anything other, other than this to happen. So we need to focus on making this technology good. We ne really need to make sure that the teacher and student access to this kind of technology and the technology that are on these devices, this educational technology, is robust and helps student learn. And I don't think this can be done with the kind of experiments that we see where we're in one classroom, one at a time, with 30 students. We need to do massive experiments. We need to have big data. We need to collect this big data. And we need to be able to see improvement over time across the whole scope of student learning. So uh, a few other people had mentioned the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center. Um, I'm part of that uh, group at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. And the uh, PSLC was created to kind of bridge this chasm between people actually doing lab studies and seeing great results, but then when they do randomized field trials in schools, they were, they were not getting significant results. So 
we created this idea of the Learn Lab, which was a uh, way for us to get in these lab results into real classrooms and, and structure it so that we could see much better kind of uh, experiment, experimental learning. And so the, what we really want to see is leveraging the uh, cognitive theory and computational modeling to identify what are the conditions for robust learning? What, what are the conditions that we can see this actual really low level learning across multiple domains? One of the outputs of the uh, PSLC has been something called DataShop, which I'm the director of. And DataShop is where all the data was initially visioned to come in from all these studies that we've done over the past 10 years. And since then, it's actually grown into much more. So it's really two, two main things. It's a repository where people can store data and uh, share data and control access to the data. And then it's also a set of analysis tools that people can uh, do various uh, kinds of uh, learning, sh showing learning over time within the tools that we provide and also model the learning. Um, there's also, you can export the data from DataShop and use it in your, your own tools, uh, use it in your favorite statistical package. And we also have web services available that people can build their own tools and attach directly to DataShop. So as a repository, as I said, it has full access management. Um, it's controlled for collaboration. We do, uh, you know, IRB, if, you, if, if you're familiar with the U.S. rules for how you have to access data, and uh, especially when it's uh, conducted within a study. Um, uh, we, we allow you to track that, see who can be approved. You can make your data set public, you can make it private. Uh, people can find your data there we, that you can s uh, search based on the type of data you want and find the kind of data. And it's been really great for uh, secondary analyses for people who are interested in a certain space. They don't have their own data or they want to try it on a different data set. They can find a data set in DataShop and see if their method works on a different data set. So how much data do we have? Uh, so here's a list. Uh, this is as of April. Um, we have about 179 million individual actions. Uh, and that represents about 400, uh, almost 450 hours of students sitting in front of some educational technology doing something. So imagine a student spending 10 or 20 minutes in the classroom working on the ed tech. That's how much we've aggregated. And you can see it's a lot of different, uh, we have language and math, science, um, lots of different domains as well. So um, originally as it was conceived, we were based around these learn labs, which were math and they were physics and they were language. Um, so we have a lot of data from those, a lot of data from the intelligent tutors. Carnegie Mellon is really well known for its intelligent tutoring systems. And a lot of the data, especially initially, was from these systems. But more and more as we're going on, we're getting more and more data from online instruction and also from games and simulation. The data's at a very fine grain level. So we're talking individual mouse clicks. We're talking the student typing in an answer. So very fine grain data. So what kind of things can we do with the data? As I said, in addition to being a repository, DataShop has a, a set of applications and web tools that you can use. And one, I'm going to talk about one of the tools today, which is doing learning curve analysis, showing learning over time, and how we can improve the models that drive adaptive learning. So it's important. Um, I'm going to use some terminology here uh, that we use in DataShop. And uh, the first is what we call a KC, or a knowledge component. And a knowledge component, uh, we actually use this term because we used to use the term skill, but some, uh, some domains that we work with said, well, what you're really talking about is not a skill. We try to use the word concept. They're like, no, it's not a concept either. So what we consider a KC is a piece of knowledge that we can track from this educational technology. Um, I, I will often use it interchangeably with the word skill. Um, so from, for example, if you were doing Fractions, uh, finding a common denominator might be a KC or a skill. Um, in geometry, finding the area of a square might be a skill or a KC. So within the educational technology, the mapping between these KCs and the content form what we call the KC model. So that's just a mapping of these skills or KCs that the people are trying to learn from the thing, uh, from the ed tech into a model for all the different opportunities they have to apply those skills or KCs. 
So, and this is really important, especially with adaptive learning, is getting this model right, because this is what we're going to use to drive the instruction. So in an adaptive learning system, we're going to be tracking what the student knows, and we're going to give them problems based on what we think the next best KC or skill is that they need to see. Um, it, it can also uh, help with uh, what kind of messages we give, what kind of, uh, if, if we think the student doesn't know or knows something in, in a certain way, we can give them a specific context, specific message just in time for them. So what, what makes a good KC model? A good KC model is one that is consistent with students' behavior. Um, it's one that should be able to predict what the student knows and what the task difficulty is. And we should also be able to use, at the very end of their instruction, what we have in this KC model for any given student should predict very well what they're going to get on their post-test that they take when they actually take a standardized test. So in general, we should see a model that really well fits the data. And one way to do that is to look at the learning curves. A uh, learning curve uh, is an empirical basis we can use to see how good the fit is and see learning over time. Um, repeated practice within an intelligent tutor or within some educational technology on a particular skill, the students should be learning and we should see their error rate decrease as they're given opportunities. So we should see a declining error rate in a learning curve. So how, do, how, how are these models made? Well, typically in the past, it's been something like uh, cognitive task analysis where you get a bunch of experts in and they say these skills or these cases are in this, this problem and these problems, and they make these mappings by hand. And fu fundamentally, we found some problems with this. It's a very human-driven process. Um, it's very highly subjective and determining, uh, as in the US, we know uh, the trouble we went through to determine what the common core skills were. Um, it's the same type of thing with these individual models. What is, you know, where do you break the skill? What level of granularity? How, how far down do you go? Um, and when we've had different people do these differently, we've gotten, gotten very different results. So uh, often they don't fit the data at all and we get really messy learning curves. So it, if it's not uh, human-centered design that we should be using, how, how should we design these models? I would say we shouldn't, that these models should be discovered, not designed. So the data is out there, we can fit the data, there is some perfect model for that system that we can find, and we should find it with the data. So we have lots of cognitive tutor. Here's an example of a problem in a cognitive tutor where the students have a lot of uh, scaffolded, uh, they have a problem there on the uh, left and on the right, they have a scaffolded little table that they fill in. And we can use this data through DataShop to improve the student models or the KC models. DataShop has a nice little interface uh, to do that. And um, we've identified kind of three strategies that we use to see whether it, the, the fit of a certain learning curve is good. So a smooth, a, if a learning curve isn't smooth, there might be a problem. If a learning curve is flat, meaning it doesn't go down, that's showing no learning, there might be a problem. And also, if we have little big peaks somewhere where we're not expecting, so the learning curve's descending, descending, suddenly there's a big jump up, there's probably something wrong with that opportunity. So here's an example of a learning curve. Um, this one doesn't look particularly well. This is a data set on geometry, and we're saying that we are learning one skill. It's called geometry, right there. Um, so we're saying every opportunity that the student has to learn in this particular ed tech is they're learning geometry. But when we fit it to the data, it's all over the board. So the, the y-axis here is the error rate. The x-axis is the opportunity. We'd like to see this smoothly going down, but we're not seeing that. So this is probably too high of a level. We need to drill down and make, make a uh, KC model that better fits this data. So now we take one with 12 skills. It's the exact same data. And the skills, I don't know if you can see it back there, but the skills are things like circle area, circle circumference, circle diameter. And what we see is a much smoother curve. So there's 12 skills in this one. Smoother curve. You'll notice there at the end, we'd like to see that go really down, but this is adaptive learning. So as students are getting more opportunities, the good students are getting pushed 
out of the system. So, so the students here at the end, the reason it pops up there is those are, th there's just a few students left and those are the students that aren't, aren't getting it. So we can identify the students that are really having problems as well. So now is this one at the bottom with these 12 skills the best model or the, the correct model? Um, we, we can look individually at these models and see um, these are those individual skill models. So this is taking the um, main one, which is up here, and we're looking at the individual items. And we can see some look very reasonable. Um, some, there's some peaks in these, but this is a really small data set. There's only about 100 students in it. This one here, though, it looks really bad. It, it's, it's flat, uh, shows no learning. In fact, it's even actually going up. It's going the wrong way. Um, so there's probably some opportunity to fix that. If we drill down a little more, we can see that it has no slope. It has a zero slope. So that says there's no learning happening. So um, I'll point out, too, this one here, I didn't, it's not particularly good because it's really flat. And what this is saying is this is actually an opportunity as well, a totally different opportunity. This is parallelogram area. Students coming in already know this skill. It's a very low error rate. We're giving students way too many parallelogram problems here. We could save a lot of time by just giving them a lot fewer. That's a different aside. But here, the composed by addition one that I have uh, circled is where students are trying to find the area of the side of a composite shape, like uh, the side of a house where it's a triangle and a square and they have to find the area. So we, we, we specifically looked and said, what, why, why are they not learning this? And if you looked at the post-test, they are learning it. So something's wrong with this model. Why are we not seeing that learning happening? And so what we hypothesized is maybe there's some additional skills. So we went at, out and actually looked at the various problems that they were choosing, and it turns out some problems were telling them, here you have the area of a side of the house. Find the area. It's a square and a triangle. And others were just saying, find the area of the shape. And so what we hypothesized is that the students, there were some of the, some of the um, items that they were trying to solve, they actually had to know that it was two shapes. Some had told them it was two shapes, but others they had to pose, they had to decompose that problem into two shapes. So we hypothesized there were additional skills here. And when we added those new skills and pulled and attached that new skill to the problems that didn't tell them the area, we got a better fit by AIC and BIC, and these are just model valuation things. I'm not going to go into it, but a cocky information criterion, Bayesian information criterion are ways that you can use to uh, compare models. And we got a better fit. We published a paper. Woohoo! It was great. <laughs> um, but what does that really mean? So the, the new model that we found should be better at driving instruction. Um, and this, it can guide the redesign of, of the uh, interaction that the student's having with the educational technology. Um, and so our, our discovery in this particular case said, hey, maybe we should resequence. Um, we need to add these new skills. Um, we need to create some new tasks that isolate those skills so we can track them. And we might need to change the instructional uh, messages. And so we, we implemented a new, uh, we did a study where we implemented this new model in the Carnegie Learning Cognitive Tutor in Geometry, and we did just that. We, we isolated some of these new skills. And what we found, we were actually surprised ourselves. So um, in the area, the students were doing the area. They were spending most of their time just solving these area and just a little bit of time on the composite. When we redid it, suddenly it was split more evenly where they were spending more time on this harder composite skill. Um, and they did it in 25% less time, which was actually fairly shocking to us. Um, uh, and the, they actually saw significant gains in the post-test for that composition skill. Um, the uh, area skill did drop a little, but it wasn't uh, significant. But so what this means is, you know, really in the post-test, we, we, we were able to teach them these skills in 25% less time. And this was in a tutor that they had been using it this old way for about 10 years. So, uh, you know, imagine if we could do this a lot, maybe 25% time would be a four-year degree in just three years. So now, uh, we did this kind of manually by hand, looking at the learning curve. So we said, can, can we automate this process? It's highly quantitative. We're looking at these curves. Yeah, we probably can. And so 
we, we, we made a, uh, we brought in some uh, machine learning people and some uh, cognitive science and psychometric people and we went through and we were able to create this process and I don't have time to really go into this process but we took the models that people had proposed and we started splitting on the differences between the model and folding them in and we sent it off to the supercomputer and we ran, let it run and uh, yeah, what we found out in the, uh, is every, every data set we applied it to, we were able to find better models. So now the, the, the issue now is there's these better fitting models and we have some idea of what got split and what got combined, which skills, but it, it's really gonna take the individuals in these particular domains to figure out what's going on. But you can see these are, these are pretty uh, wide variety of content domains from geometry area, story problems, fractions, English articles and statistics. So the, the method works on a large, large variety of different domains. Um, so let me just jump into some other things that I'm doing. Uh, I'm over time already. Um, uh, a couple projects I'm working on. One is called Learning Linkages, where we're looking at different mo multimodal data coming in and uh, different data streams from different people. So I'm, I'm really interested in this log data, and that's what I know very well. But we've engaged with some people who do more qualitative studies and some people who look at uh, larger uh, longitudinal data, and we're seeing what predicts what. Um, secondly, we're building the method that I just showed you into a uh, instructor uh, designer, instructional design feature for MOOCs, so that people can start with things like their learning objectives as the original KC model, and see how that fits the data, and then work it as each iteration of the MOOC goes on, they can improve the model over time. And then the second, uh, probably the largest thing that I'm working on now is kind of the next generation data shop, which we're calling LearnSphere. And LearnSphere um, is gonna be a much bigger infrastructure that supports many different kinds of data. So one of the issues with data shop is that it had been very much this transactional tutor data. And how, how can we break that out and get additional data? Um, so this is an NSF funded project that started in January and it's gonna run five years. It's got a very impressive team of Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Stanford, and the University of Memphis. And what we're looking at, what we found is there's these data sil silos out there. So DataShop was very much siloed data. There was also this discourse data, so things like uh, forums on MOOCs and other classroom discourse. Uh, there's actually a lot of data out there for that. And also, uh, we brought in MOOCDB, which is an MIT product uh, that they've been working on. And we're looking at the different, you know, different types of data, different duration of data collection, and where do these mix, and how, how can we integrate these? Um, the other thing is uh, the LearnSphere. One of the other issues we've had with getting people to put their data into DataShop has been that um, it's... Uh, we can't put your data on, our, on your server. We have to keep our data locally. So we're making it a distributed model so everyone's gonna be able to install their own LearnSphere and just put the metadata back to the main central LearnSphere. Um, we're also moving from a data set centric um, look into more of a workflow. So we really wanna focus on the analyses that people are doing as opposed to the data. So some real quick takeaways. Um, the amount of educational data that's coming in is growing and it's growing exponentially. Um, we're trying to harness that data. Um, when I first started building DataShop eight years ago, uh, and it's been a long time to get to where we are, a lot of people, when I go to big data events that were not specific to education, they would not consider education a big data science. Um, that's changing. People are seeing the kind of data we're collecting, and it is now considered one of the big datas. Um, also, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough, students are going to be forced to re rely on technology whether we want it or not, and so we have to make sure that the technology is good. And I think really it's going to be these human-centered data-driven approaches that are combined that are really going to make the big successes in improving educational technology. So thank you.